Well, we're almost we're almost there. It's uh, December 23rd and we're all traveling and meeting with our family uh, members, friends, etc. Um, I thought I would take a quick casual uh, moment to just briefly talk about the town of Royston, 50 miles north of London. And um, I gave a very quick rundown in my, in my book here because, because this book was about several subjects and also racing the clock so that this would coincide with my interview on the Curse of Oak Island season 10, uh, the opening uh, episodes. And that was quite a, a privilege to have been invited to participate in that. Uh, certainly when filming, this is about Oak Island. So not everything that I discovered about Royston Cave or the town was in that episode because the focus was Oak Island. And some of the imagery that, that if I'd had a, an opportunity to, to uh, discuss the imagery in the cave, I might have included and expanded to a few more carvings that are, are in the cave because they pinpoint specifically the Knights Templar. One of the best, if not the best, if you really want a deep dive, a nerdy deep dive into Royston Cave, we owe uh, Sylvia P. Beeman, Masters, uh, a huge debt of, of gratitude. She made Royston Cave her life's work and she was participating, she participated in one of the archeology span uh, assessments. And uh, her book, Royston Cave, Used by Saints or Sinners, uh, it unfortunately is out of print. If you can get a copy, it's expensive. So uh, it is a magnificent academic work. We owe her a debt of gratitude. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2010. So we can no longer, or 2011, we can no longer speak to her about these matters. Uh, she is without a doubt incredibly strict and academically minded. So the etymology of the name of Royston is complex, it's varied, and it goes back many centuries. Roy, R-O-Y, is a derivative of R-O-I in French, which means king. In Latin, it's rex, R-E-X. Uh, so that's very important to keep in mind. So, so yes, R-O-Y is important, but that is not the, the name uh, of, the, of the, that's not where Royston got its name from. Royston is actually a market town by royal decree. You had to get permission from the monarch, normally, usually a king rarely a queen, uh, but uh, Royston can be traced back centuries and it was given a royal seal of approval to become a royal market town. Uh, the Augustinians ran the church at the crossroads, however, it was a market town and it is surmised uh, that by Sylvia that the Templars owned several different properties in the town. And because it was at a major crossroads, Royston is 50 miles north out of London on the old Roman road. And it is uh, not too far from the uh, Templar headquarters in London, Temple Church, to the old Roman road. Um, Royston was given its start uh, very early on, and one of the earliest mentions of it is in the royal close rolls of England 
And this uh, reference goes all the way back to Edward III, who's a very interesting character, 1356. And at that juncture, Royston was called Royston, a very, or, or, and its spelling has changed changed over the years. And, and on July 2nd, uh, 1356, the reference is um, uh, regarding the town of Royston and a legal matter that ensued that had to be solved in, in, in court at Westminster in London, which is the palace of, of kings where, where administration was done. But it goes all the way back that far at least. It is a market, royal market town. Uh, so that is verifiable. Um, it actually began earlier than that. The church was built earlier than that. And Joffrey de Mandeville is a key figure in the town of Royston. And at, at times you might even see the spelling of R-O-Y-F-T-O-N. Uh, F often being taking place of the the S in the alphabet and spelling is is we take it for granted you know we have it's so spelling today is is so standardized but you could go back and take two different highly educated people they're going to have different spelling no punctuation and hopefully you'd be able to read what they were writing. So that's always a difficulty too. But this is one of the very earliest dates of the town. And at that time, French was spoken because it was the language of the court. Uh, William the Conqueror came over in 1066 and, and uh, conquered and took the, the throne of, of uh, the Kingdom of England from the uh, prior king, uh, the Eng English king. So uh, in comes the French uh, uh, language, which was spoken as the court approved uh, language of the, of the day. But this is a very ancient uh, town. Um, the town is actually commiserate with the Templar historic period. And there are arguments between Royston, run by the Augustinians, and also the Templars. And there is a um, dated uh, comment uh, in, the, in the close rolls of how a t Templar had been accosted, had been, had been attacked by the Augustinians in town when he went there on his, on his duties. Uh, it is my absolute uh, thought that the Augustinians were not thrilled that there was a Templar market stall on the main road at the crossroads there, and that would have been very close to their church, which they were running. And it would have been very antagonistic, uh, but there would have been a structure over the cave, over Royston Cave itself, where you would have had Templars manning it on market days, which is typically a Wednesday. And that whole street would have been covered with a variety of, of kiosks and permanent structures and very higgledy-piggledy looking too. Uh, you, you didn't have the building codes that we have today. So it would have been very higgledy-piggledy looking and there would have been everybody there from flower sellers to butchers to wool to, you know, and who knows, maybe the Templars were selling wool, which is a mainstay of, of, of their, of their uh, economic world along with wheat. Um, selling spikes, horseshoes, anything. So down the road, eight and a half miles away, is Temple Baldock, also given permission near to the same time. And uh, at the moment, I can't recall when it was uh, uh, created as a market town by royal decree, but the Templars, eight and a half miles south of, of Royston, build their own church and their own uh, market town. So they were trading directly with the 
general public, which as merchants, which is wonderful, because this goes right into the theory, my theory, that they were trading with the merchant guilds. They were part of the merchant guilds. So that's a little bit of a sidetrack. But yeah, the merchant guilds are very hierarchical to a military level, and you'll have some of the more elite uh, guilds actually naming their uh, offices, officers in a military sense, such as, as Grand Master, literally, matching pretty much toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with the military orders. So the line is blurred, and that's how after 1307, you end up with the disappearance of many Templars going into the merchant guilds, which eventually become uh, uh, the, the Freemasons uh, and also the Rosicrucians. But Baldock, uh, getting back to the name of the town, is a derivative of Baghdad. So the Templars had been involved with an ill-fated campaign in Egypt and they, they were certainly present in the Holy Land, that's without a doubt. And uh, they, they were, their presence there was very strong. So the Augustinians are not happy that, that the Templars have set up shop eight and a half miles down the road. And it is during the Templar historic period, which is 1120 up through, you know, up through 1307. So, so somewhere in there is a reference to the Augustinians being unhappy with the Templars who are trading in town. I don't have that direct reference. But uh, it, is, it is fascinating that um, you've got a reference in 1356 during the reign of Edward III who is, is um, within living memory of uh, the Templar order having been, been uh, closed down and dissolved. And he actually in 1348 creates the Order of the Garter, which is the pre preeminent chivalric order in the world today. And of course, the kings and queens of England are the head of that order, and uh, their membership is is twenty four in number, and it's a lifelong post. So it's really interesting the date in Royston Cave of thirteen forty seven. It's only off by one year of thirteen forty eight when Edward the Third creates an Arthurian order of the Garter, which I believe was also. Uh, inspired by Templars. Now everybody has a fixation that the Templars had to go to Scotland to escape. There were a lot of Templars in England, and yes, some of them got arrested, but I believe that Edward III had a lot of Templar sympathy. That's another story, but I wanted to share this with you to, in brief, to to those of you who, who are querying, querying the medieval uh, context of Royston. Uh, this is a carving in the cave, and while I was there, I was pleased to have found two other axes. This here is an axe, believe it or not. And Sylvia, in her book, uh, got permission from uh, Israel. They hold a photograph of a Templar grave uh, stone. And on it is what is called a sacred axe. One side means that, that uh, you have, have perished. The other side of the, the middle stem means that you have been resurrected and uh, survived in, in, in Christ, if you will. So uh, there are three of these axes in Royston Cave. And of course, the heart is very important, and the hand is very important. The heart and hand is a medieval symbol. So that is one of the, the reasons why the dating of Royston cannot, Cave cannot possibly be uh, uh, in early modern times. And by that, by that, I mean anything from, say, 1500 on up. Also, the armor that's depicted in the cave is far earlier. And you also have kite shields. 
and uh, the the round uh, you'll see the round concentric circles. That's a floor plan of the Holy Sepulchre. There is the Cambridge Round Church, which is just up the road from Royston Cave, and it is thought that those that built Round Tower Church also had a hand in building Royston Cave. So there's a lot more to, to, to share here on that, but I can't possibly give you all of that in one short video. The other interesting thing, Geoffrey de Mandeville, who has gone down in history as a bit of a villain, uh, which is very sad, uh, he actually remained loyal to Henry II, the father of Richard Lionheart. When Henry died, Henry, um, oh, forgive me, am I getting that a bit, a bit muddled? I probably am. Uh, it, you know, when different kings have different, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's how many Georges are there, how many Henrys are there, etc. But it is, uh, it is my assertion that Geoffrey de Mandeville and his wife, Lady Roisia, R-O-I, uh, which is a derivative of French, again, you know, and this was an old French family. There are two Lady Roisias. Uh, his mother of the same name and his wife, R-O-I, and then the Zia, S-I-A, is a feminization of king. So basically, his mother-in-law and his wife were both called, named queen. So, Roy Zia. So it's, it's Roy Zia's town. And there had been a very ancient cross resurrected uh, put in 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 at that crossroads because uh, that family, that that pair gave gave money to that town, so you had Lady Roisia's cross, so the 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 name of the town is ancient. the The town itself has its roots in a royal market town that was instituted during the historic period of the Knights Templar. So we know how, what it was called. The spellings are varied. And of course, the, the inspiration for the town was, was female and, and uh, Queen's Town, basically in English. So uh, that is the, the etymology of the name of Royston. Uh, and uh, so the name is feminized, uh, Roisia's Town. And uh, so anyway, a bit, a bit about bit about that background. So unfortunately, her husband sided with uh, Matilde, uh, Empress Matilde, who had been married to the Holy Roman Emperor, and she was a princess of England. He died, so the King of England, who was also dying at that time, shortly afterward, called her home and said, I want you to be the queen. And uh, unfortunately, because she, you know she's a woman, and that didn't go down very well with some of of those who who wanted to support it, her younger brother, King Stephen, who was thirty, you know, thirty eight, I believe, at the time. Uh, but he wanted the crown. He rebelled against his father's wishes and his his, his sister, I believe, and uh, what was uh, uh, ensued was a period called the anarchy, and I just really feel for those who lived at that time in England because there was no rule of law. Uh, so you have Geoffrey de Mandeville, who uh, Stephen says is an outlaw because I'm the rightful king because I'm a man, uh, so uh, I'm going to take over. And he had support of a lot of barons, but uh, Stephen stayed true to the king's wishes and Matilde. Matilde eventually, after many battles, you know, back and forth across England, and at one point she had half of England in her, her hands, she f goes to exile in France and bears a son there, who eventually becomes the king's when Stephen dies. And she never returns to England. But uh, unfortunately uh, for Geoffrey de Mandeville, he is killed in battle. Um, uh, which is very, very sad. Fortunately, his wife, Lady Roisia, does not uh, run afoul uh, and is not 
not harmed through through that that very difficult time but this is the one of the most interesting interesting things about this period is that nobody wanted to risk Stephen's wrath so the Templars took his body nobody wanted to bury him on consecrated ground and risk Stephen's wrath so this 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 body of this high-ranking um, uh, uh, knight this 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 Lord who owned lots of property had castles who who uh, was played a, a large role in the town of Royston a market town so he's left to to uh, decompose in a uh, iron cage in a tree for, for a long time. So eventually, uh, because of his association with the Knights Templar, they take him and they bury him in London headquarters Temple Church, and he is one of nine effigies remaining in Temple Church. Uh, most of them are uh, presumed to be knights. The only other secular burials there within the effigies uh, are William Marshall, the greatest knight, and his son. So why did the Templars take responsibility knowing there would be a diplomatic incident when they buried uh, Sir Geoffrey uh, Mandeville. So I'd like to leave that with you. There is a great deal more um, and in the shape of a mermaid you'll find in Royston Cave Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, depicted uh, as a mermaid because her mother, pardon me, her mother is uh, a, a, a lady of the house of Rochefoucauld whose emblem is Melusine, the mermaid. So you do have Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, Richard's mother. Richard's also depicted in the cave wearing correct attire with a, a shield, correct for the time frame. And she's depicted as, as Melusine. So that's fascinating. But I just wanted to share some of that information with you that I found when I was researching Royston. And it's absolutely the case that, that James I took over that town, basically, and made it his own. But it was a royal stopover on the way to London because it was on the Roman road that goes all the way up to York, which is a, a vital capital of the north of England. So royals on their procession, they would process around the country and they would take their court with them to make sure that the lords uh, who were militarily responsible for that particular uh, area, that particular county or, or duchy, what have you, were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So they would take their whole court with them, their whole legal system with them, and they would process around the country. So on the way back to London from the north, they would stop over in Royston. But it was James who created a massive hunting lodge there. It's now only half the size of what it used to be. And I'll insert a photograph here. It looks really Odd because it's been basically shaved in half and half the front half of the house is was torn down uh, so that's a photograph of me that I'm inserting so you can see what it looks like today and he brought with him some 350 individuals and they took over this market town and and they he grew this town and I am convinced that he is one of many mar monarchs that used that cave for for spiritual purposes in a very private manner, manner as a Freemason as a early Freemason and as a devout man. He was very devout, uh, but he is not the only monarch to have been in that cave. And I believe the cave has been shut at times of, of political unrest, reopened and reused, but the carvings have stayed true to the time period in which they were done. These carvings are not that of high art. The carvings were done by an individual whose expertise lay somewhere else. So their carvings are not beautiful. They're not expert. They're not proportionately 
correct or even beautiful. Um, you see a lot of standard, bog standard Christian iconography down there, but when you marry it up with everything else that is going on in that cave, it's Templar, and we have to remember that the Templars were operating under the auspices of Catholicism. It was the only game in town up until the Reformation, various Reformation movements started kicking in and taking over. So uh, there's so much to Royston Cave. Its, its history is vast and, and deep. And um, if you really want a nerdy deep dive, which I was not able to give you in my book, get Sylvia Beeman, Beeman's uh, copy of her book. And um, it's expensive and, and good luck finding one. They're, they're difficult to find. Uh, but the close rolls uh, clearly show that, that ancient name going way back. So um, I hope you find this of interest. And of course, I, I can't give you everything that, that uh, is in that cave. That would require probably a deep dive of about three hours. And we were filming in the cave on that day for about that much time. And there is a lot of history to it. Uh, some very interesting objects were found when it was uh, discovered in 1742. Discovered. So <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'll leave you with that. And I, I want to wish you and yours a very happy holiday season. Um, Hanukkah has just passed. I want to wish you Merry Christmas. Solstice has just passed. Happy Solstice to those of you who honor the, the wheel of the year. And of course, to everyone, Happy New Year. Be healthy. Take care of yourself. May you prosper. May, may your loved ones likewise prosper. Thank you. Take care. Respect yourself and respect others. Thank you.